feedback. Perfect. So. Good. So, uh, any so so a very very brief recap of the current topic, and then we'll go back into the specifics. Okay. Um, should I do the recap? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, since November, I've been exploring uh, a parsing in a completely different, um, um, you know. Um, Tr uh, you know, like removed from um, common ways of, of parsing JavaScript. And my idea was to create a regular expression based um, parsing that um, at runtime can safely find um, uh, certain features and not be, um, um, you know, interested or, or impacted by um, sometimes uh, unexpected things happening in between. So, so it's a balance between knowing enough, but not knowing everything um, and not knowing too little. Um, so the idea is obviously you have an opener, you expect a closer. The idea at runtime, if there's a syntax error, um, parsing or not parsing, uh, the runtime will throw anyway. Um, so, um, so yeah, so we're basically running through, um, um, I guess, validation or, or I don't know what, what to call it, but we're, we're exploring, you know, how well this fares out and if there are um, better ways to improve it or. Yeah, so, so my concern is that, um, you know, the, the use case that we, that we started with is a use case that's tremendously uh, important um, for uh, a lot of our purposes, which is, uh, could you, without the overhead of a full parse, accurately recognize things like import and export expressions uh, so that you can translate them into something else, leaving all of the text between them as just pass-through text rather than having to uh, regenerate them from an AST? And I think that's a good goal. I think that's an achievable goal uh, and a valuable one. Um, uh, uh, but if you don't tokenize accurately, and the inaccuracy has the characteristic that a correct JavaScript program that correctly should be seen as having one token sequence, if the recognizer recognize it as having a different correct token sequence, then just very specifically in terms of this use case, is uh, it might misunderstand what looks like an import expression that's inside a comment or a quoted string or a regular expression, it might misunderstand that to be a genuine import statement and vice versa. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that, that um, uh, is definitely, um, I'm at a point right now where I want to find cases that this occurs and see good ways to actually, um, um, you know, uh, evolve the approach to, um, you know, find good ways to avoid, you know, falling into these uh, problems. Um, so, uh, but up until this point, and I'll be very, very um, honest, my goal was to uh, not throw anywhere um, until I see output. And when the output looks wrong, that is the only um, uh, debugging um, that I needed at this point. Because if, if I'm parsing wrong, I'm developing this. Uh, I'm refining my method. And if I get less errors, uh, then I'm moving in the right direction. OK. My, my concern is the cases where um, uh, there was no genuine error and mm -hmm. there was no perceived error. But what yeah. was perceived was different than what was genuinely expressed, i.e., the program get mis gets misinterpreted. Yeah. And then if you transform based on that misinterpretation, the yeah. resulting program might still um, uh, uh, parse and run on the underlying JavaScript engine, but the transform program has now been uh, transformed in a way that did not correspond to the transform intended. In particular, that uh, import expressions in comments or literal strings got transformed and, and generating report statements did not get transformed. Yes. Um, so and, I, I, and I, I believe, I'll just state it as a belief, I believe that the only way to avoid that 
is to pay the full costs up front to do an accurate tokenization or to decide that you don't have to accept all of JavaScript for the purposes that, that you're interested in. And for example, um, don't do semicolons. I just, as an example, this is, this is an example that comes from what we're doing with Jesse, is just don't do semicolon insertion since semicolon insertion is only triggered by what would be a parse error. Mm -hmm. Just take the parse error and reject the program if the program would cause semicolon insertion. If you take that approach, then accurately tokenizing will become much, much easier. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think, um, I think running through um, code that exists out in the wild is about the best um, uh, thing I can, I can uh, try this on at this point in time. Um, up until this week, I, I, I could not really uh, build up enough courage to refactor my experimental uh, work, so, but I did this week. That part done has given me confidence to actually know that, okay, you know, at least um, one or two people will be, be able to reason about this. And talking about something missed, um, I think I don't have a definition for this in my lists here. Uh, sorry. Yeah, got distracted. Uh, I'll get it out of the way and we'll be, uh, where was it? Where was it? Uh, yeah, it should be here, right? It should be after this one or before it. Um, it's just like that. So let's see if, if we fix that. You, they tell you never do that live, right? So um, where were we when that happened? Ah, it was around here. Yeah. Okay, anyway, so I, I just fixed a bug that I should have discovered a while ago, but I never use um, uh, not equal, like I use the triple. Anyways. Um, what's doing that rendering? Uh, sorry? So you, you presumably what's act the actual ASCII sequence uh, for the text I'm seeing in the upper left corner is next equal bang equal null. Oh, ligatures. I'm using a font, uh, like a typeface that has ligatures on. So it transforms the not uh, like um, this and this. They become, um, they, they just look like they are um, not what they are, uh, but what they're meant to look like. Uh, okay. Sorry. That's very, very cool. Yeah, so, so this is something I didn't come up with. It existed in, uh, in, in the first uh, iteration of PostScript fonts, something called font ligatures. Okay. Yeah, so I just found a font that has the ones that work very nice in JavaScript. Oh, era, wonderful, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, so, so this has been the kind of like the artistic side of like, I like how this looks and the color theme as well. Those okay. are the creative parts, you know. When I can't write code, I, uh, so I pick the color theme um, with colors that basically work on both light and dark with very, very little adjustment to the um, saturated colors. Okay. Um, anyways, um, so, so unlike, um, so, so obviously I'm, I'm keeping my, my level of knowledge up until this point to the bare minimum. Um, I, I have not started to explore what we need to know beyond top level because I was thinking uh, I want to know exports uh, that are destructured. Um, you know, export cons, destructured, whatever. That has been the one thing that, that made me uh, come to the conclusion that regular expressions alone are not going to ever work. Mm -hmm. Um, so the idea that people said regular expressions are not the way to go, but you have to do a while loop and you have to scan, tokenize, and, um, and rewrite your, a you know, and create the AST and then unfold the AST. All that I thought was uh, very good until you actually have to use a third party AST and they don't have a plugin for something that has already landed in the browser. Um, and you can't use it in the browser if you use a tool that uses this ASD transform. Um, so, so, you know, all these um, problems um, to me um, felt that they are going to really make it sometimes impossible um, 
to have your runtime do very, very minor linking um, and hope that the package you use for the transform can um, catch up with what the browser can actually do. Um, so these were all things that, um, you know, they, they still are um, a lot more complicated than what I can do at this point. So what I do at this point is, based on operators, um, I uh, infer where a keyword can occur or not occur. Um, you know, I, I might not be able to give a good summary. There has been like at least seven months of thinking of details. Um, and maybe I don't summarize well or explain well. <laughs> so, so what I look for when I'm seeing, when I'm asking whether or not I'm parsing correctly is if I see a keyword that is not supposed to be a keyword, um, um, then I, I wonder, is it a keyword? Because it could have been a keyword, uh, only I, I don't have the full JavaScript rules to say it is not. And if it being thought of as a keyword is a runtime error or a parsing error, uh, because if it is a runtime error, it's going to be a runtime error at runtime. Um, if it is a parsing error, then I have to make some more decisions. Um, so, you know, these are just, you know, philosophically very different than if you're building a full AST. Okay. What's the pr so, so with this, with, with this approach, um, uh, it does not satisfy the use case I have in mind where the source code might be constructed by an adversary for purposes of fooling your tokenizer. Um, we actually, uh, at, um, in Kaha at Google, uh, with an earlier version of SES, uh, SES was actually using the Acorn parser. Yes. And the Acorn parser actually had some mistakes mm -hmm. in its tokenization logic. Um, yeah. And we had several responsible disclosures against SES, at least one, I think more than one, that was due to somebody figuring out a way to, to maliciously construct a source code string that hit one of those edge conditions that Acorn got wrong. Yes. Um, so I, I, I would like to maybe restate what you said about this not satisfying. This is not yet satisfying because I'm at a point where, um, like, I've done I've done a lot of work, but I've done all this work independently. Um, I want to start um, checking where I need to focus. Where um, you know, even so you're, not, you're not going to get that by a corpus of normal programs, even by a very large corpus of normal programs, because programmers, in order to write reasonable code, avoid writing code that hits these um, tokenization edge cases. Uh, you have to find a test suite that really probes these tokenization edge cases and try your, 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 try your tokenizer against that. So, so I, and, I, and I'm hoping, OK, so I, I can maybe say, uh, do you guys have an unpackaged, like any package on NPM um, um, that I can mm -hmm. That you're you, you, it might be that you pass everything you find in NPM, uh, but still create a vulnerability that, that an adversarial author can take advantage of. Yeah. So, um, so is, uh, are you um, interested in, in seeing this um, refined by, by maybe um, coming up with a plan to, um, you know, look for uh, cases that can be better, um, you know, handled and stuff like that, or? I, I don't think you're going to get to safety by doing incremental engineering on, um, on this approach uh, by testing it against edge cases. I think you have to start by constructing a grammar machine based on the grammar definition. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, constructing a state machine based on the grammar definition. And what I'll refer you to is Tim Disney's uh, dissertation 
he did a um, very interesting hygienic macro system uh, for JavaScript, uh, which I'm certainly, and you know, he does a full parse and all sorts of crazy AST stuff, uh, almost all of which is not relevant to what we're talking about here. But uh, the key thing that, that Tim Disney did is he figured out how to do an accurate tokenization without parsing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, so, so uh, if I recall correctly, there were, you only needed something like four states. Uh, each of those states had a different set of rules for recognizing the next token. And depending on what the state and token was, that put you into another state. So it was just a little state machine. Uh, yeah. And then you have to additionally have logic for the one context dependent thing. The one thing that's, that's um, uh, um, yeah, context dependent, which is uh, the thing you've already done, uh, which is the uh, bracket counting. Uh, yeah. uh, so, so that you know when a, a substitution hole inside a template literal is closed. Um, but if you've got, um, so you've already got the, the you know, the thing, the um, context dependent part, because you're already doing the, the bracket counting, assuming that you've recognized a bracket. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I think you, you, you uh, in order to avoid a full parse, but accurately tokenize, I would start with um, uh, the tokenizer in Tim, Tim Disney's dissertation. Okay, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna make a note of that. Um, so it, it, there might be that uh, I'm also not able to express um, some answers to your question. Um, so, um, so what else could I, um, you know, is, is, is there something you're, uh, you might be interested in knowing that I could um, you know, uh, take us through? Um, uh, let me see if I can find one of these perverse cases. Uh, Waldemar uh, is often the person to come up with the most amusing perverse cases. Uh, and then we can actually just try your system out against it. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, like, so, so basically I, I don't have the um, proper um, terminology. Um, I've, 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 came, I, I've come up with terminology based on uh, looking up a concept and trying to understand it on my own. Um, there has not been really any, um, um, you know, peer review or anything. So, so I might not be using the right term to describe things. Um, and I might uh, be misunderstanding some concepts. So my hope is, you know, if, if they do get refined, um, given if, you know, if, as long as um, we find edge cases that prove satisfactory, uh, or interesting at least, um, then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely hoping I can put more effort into it. Um, I, think, I think the structure has to reflect the, you know, ha has to be derived from the ground. It, it is to a very, very large extent, um, but it also tries to avoid writing uh, rules that require to, to be um, functions. Um, so all my rules are based on uh, the assumption, again, that you've run your code uh, in your editor, through your linter, through whatever, but even if it's minified, it doesn't make mistakes, and that's the important thing. Um, so um, I want to see if we have a minified code example that I can show. You know, I, I keep... So, so I th I mean, let's only go back to the question about what are the use cases that are motivating you to do this? Um, well, it, it was initially that, um, you know, I think we covered them earlier, at least that uh, at runtime, if you wanted to, um, to make very, very little uh, modifications to code, um, it, it's, it's reasonable in Node to expect that you can install Babel and have it at runtime, do your code and run it. But if you're, if you're wanting that privilege in the browser, 
or in a place where um, you're restricted, uh, memory or otherwise, then Babel is maybe not an ideal thing to have on your uh, client side, but rather uh, server side. Okay. So, so, so far, uh, everything, you know, th this fits um, uh, with everything that, that I would be looking for as well. Um, uh, now, for my purposes, I need to consider uh, adversarial um, uh, text. Uh, yes. For your purposes, are you concerned about adversarial text or are um, you just concerned about normal text? I, I, I want to get to normal text is okay and then refine for adversarial, but for my case, I did not, it wasn't part of my initial design. But it was definitely triggered uh, by some people saying that if you parse with regular, ex if you are tokenizing with regular expressions, you will always be uh, less secure than other kind of, um, you know, approaches. And I really wanted to say that there are two, two things you're confusing here. Regular expressions that are written badly um, can be hijacked. Um, a, a while loop that is not written with the right scanning um, uh, logic can also be hijacked. Um, so, so it, it was really driven that that is. Oh, I'm sorry. Say, say it again. Like, if you use a regular expression that that is written badly alone, a single regular expression is never going to work. But if if you are switching between regular expressions, um, and you don't write the right regular expressions, then you will be as vulnerable as a scanning tokenizer with a while loop that goes over every single character that doesn't uh, have the right logic running. So regular expressions or not is not really the problem. It's just the yeah, I agree that regular expressions are the problem. Once you know what mode you're in yes. for recognizing the next token, I yes. believe that in all cases, um, uh, I, I believe this, I don't, I, I don't know this for sure, so somebody should correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that once you know what mode you're in, you can, regular, you can use a regular expression to recognize the next token, but only the next token, because that recognition might put you into a different mode that you need to know that you're in that mode in order to know what regular expression to use to recognize the following token. Exactly. And, and aside from a glossing definition for regular expressions, because I didn't want to write the mode for regular expression parsing yet, uh, I wanted, um, and honestly, I didn't, I didn't know how the design will look like if we're going to switch modes. So aside from regular expressions, I, I, I tokenize one token, see how it affects um, my context, uh, if it opens something, if it closes something, you know, so if my goal changes because of a token, I switch to the regular expression of that goal and, and continue in that goal. So I, I do update context on every token. And part of my challenge was to come up with a design that will do this efficiently. Um, and I've, I've, I've explored different patterns, but it, it all came down to a generator. Uh, based uh, design, which I could rewrite as an iterator. Um, a, a, gen a, gener a generator is fine, um, and using regular expressions um, uh, to recognize the next token is also fine, um, and using a generator to turn that into um, uh, um, uh, a, you know, a stream of tokens that something else can pull on is fine. Um, I just want to understand what your tokenizing states are and when you mean and, and under what conditions you move between them. Okay, so um, I'll uh, just see if I can uh, get one thing here. Um, hopefully this will, yes. So, so even minified code um, is, um, you know, I, I, I've, I've glossed over this uh, before, so I'll tell you that it does catch keywords where it should, because that was part of my challenge to make sure minified code uh, does that. But so, so let me tell you um, how I handle contexts. Okay. Um, I basically match uh, a token that is a punctuator of some sort. Um, and I have four contextual punctuators. 
um, a, a span is something that opens uh, like a span in a template literal. And that basically tells me that I'm inside a span um, that is inside the parent context, whatever that is. So, so any grammar can have a parent context and a parent context can have spans. Um, you cannot have a span without uh, being in a parent context. Uh, that is different from the root context or the mode of the, of the actual language itself. Um, so that was just an odd case because template uh, literals are really um, unconventional, um, you know, compared to other languages uh, that I'm interested in parsing, like HTML and CSS. Um, a quote is uh, something that starts a string. That's, that's about it. Uh, and a comment punctuator is something that starts a comment. Um, and then I have a closure. And this can be anything that shares mostly the grammar of the language. You know, like, like we're talking about literal um, curly braces or uh, square brackets um, or you know, round parentheses, um, regardless of whether or not they're function body or object at this point. Uh, so, so like the curly braces I need. Um, there, there, there is a need to actually refine tokenizing in a closure, which I did not seem to hit a case that required a lot, a lot of, um, you know, experimenting or exploration in this area. Um, I found that a closure did not affect my safe tokenization of things so far. Um, um, from, from whatever closures look like in the JavaScript uh, grammar. Um, so the special case is the span inside the template literal, which is kind of a closure, but um, this one would have been very problematic if I put it with the same, um, uh, with the same um, you know, um, strategies that I did for closure. Um, uh, is that going in the direction that you were, um, uh, you know, curious about? Um, uh, I think so. And the, 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 what I'm finding, so in the, the Tim Disney approach, he did not, he did not need to recognize closures at all. Um, I mean, in avoiding parsing, he was basically, um, uh, you know, do, his state machine had to do um, uh, essentially just with um, what's necessary for the next token. Yeah. Uh, and whether you're in a closure or not uh, uh, has nothing to do with how to interpret the next token. Um, only if I'm identifying import and export as a key as a maybe keyword token. So any token I generate is a maybe. It's not a it's not a firm thing. So I say it's maybe keyword, and it's not inside a closure. Then it has to be an import or an export. That that was my thinking. So that import and so so uh, JavaScript has several levels, several different categorizations of keyword-like things. There's keywords and reserved words, and there's whether yeah. you're floppy or strict, and I don't remember all the distinctions. Yeah. Th those are separate from what I call a keyword here. A keyword here is a word that, uh, that has um, significance. In, in... I, I, I believe it is the case mm -hmm. that uh, import and export, uh, uh, if they're not in property name position, yes. uh, are always keywords. Um, the, the grammar has this thing about identifier versus identifier name. That's that's true. Um, that, that 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 is definitely true. But um, so so from from um, from trying to determine if it's an import statement or an export statement, as in static imports and exports, uh, as opposed to import dot meta and, and these other um, you know other uses for import, um, static import and export statements are always top level. Dynamic are um, and whatever you want to do it could be top level, um, uh, but import dot meta is really it can occur anywhere as well, just like um, just like a dynamic import. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so um, to cut uh, a long, um, um, you know, a long, uh, uh, you know, um, process of determining top level versus uh, versus not for an export statement, I basically said if we have if if there is a closure in in the stack, then it's not top level. Um, it didn't take much more work from me to have this here. Um, but it also allowed me to say that if I wanted to refine uh, based on closures, um, other language features that are not just import and export, I, I have already in the design of the tokenizer the efficient way to do it. It already recognizes where they occur. Um, and, and, and that's um, separate from um, you know, the uh, runtime closure concept altogether. Okay. So, um, uh, so what I think I'm getting from this is that uh, it's, um, you're not really just trying to tokenize. You actually are trying to some degree to parse in order to create this nested context object so that whatever transform you would like, whatever you know, light transform you would like to do, that that light transform can still be um, conditioned on um, uh, uh, some uh, parsing information. True. So, like whether, you're, whether or not you're in a closure is information that conceptually comes from a parsing, not from a tokenizer. True. So I've, I've only done about enough parsing that you would uh, not need to run through the entire thing from the beginning. If okay. Something. Uh, okay. That so so, so that, that sounds like a, like a sensible and valuable goal, and it was not in my head. So that really does help clarify things. So, so if I so wanted a partial to... Partial parser. Yeah, so it is, it is really, uh, like I call it a semi-contextual parsing. So it tells you it's in a curly brace. If you want to know it's a function or not, find the parent, uh, the opener, and look before it. Does it look like a function? Then, you know, take after it. Does it look like a function? That's all additional work that you will choose to do, uh, but you don't have to start from the beginning. Uh, all you have to know is where the curlies occur uh, to tell you that this uh, particular body is something worthy of you to do the extra work. You, you see what I mean? So, so it's giving the, the um, positions of interest. So, uh, so, so the, the, a curly that begins a block. Yeah. This is a curly that begins an object literal. Um, All the same. OK. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Even arrays are all the same. Uh, parentheses are all the same. I I, I don't do anything about. Okay. So um, so let's so this thing about uh, is import a keyword or an identifier? Um, uh, if the curly begins an object literal, yeah. Then the next token, you know, if if the open curly is followed by import colon, uh, yeah. since that is a property name position, yeah. Uh, it's just treated as a pop property name, not as a keyword. Well, maybe I, I couldn't find a better word to use here, but my keyword is not job is not ECMAScript keyword. My identifier is rather um, um, maybe identifier, and my keyword is potentially a word of significance. Determining whether it's an ECMAScript keyword or not is again, just like determining what the curly braces mean, it is something that um, if that's what you, you need to be doing, then whatever tokens you get here will have enough information for you to determine whether or not it's an ECMAScript keyword or not. Um, I just used a, um, a, a, a prefix notation, I think that's what they call it, a prefix notation strategy um, to uh, to not identify a keyword in a position that cannot happen, uh, and it has held true that every time there has been a JavaScript keyword, it has been read. The only time where I've seen read words that are not JavaScript keywords are when they were keys in the object literal. Um, let me ask 
uh, Richard or Michael who, who uh, joined the call, um, uh, do either of you know of any place to find good, juicy adversarial examples, examples that are um, that really uh, show off why JavaScript is so hard to tokenize? Uh, you know, combining slashes with with semicolon insertion and that kind of thing, and, and regular expressions that are potentially not regular expressions. That I would love that. <laughs> uh, so there's for that last one. There's actually an example in the spec. Uh, I believe it's in the section on semicolon insertion. But but just a general corpus of difficult cases. I'm not aware of one. Okay. Um, uh, might test two six two already have a set of such difficult cases? I've been trying to comb through it. Um, I, I, I have like uh, JSON data being collected from uh, regular expression occurrences. That's that's what I've been interested in so far. But I still haven't gone through to sift and find. You know, I think I ended up matching um, the Visual Studio Code matcher uh, wasn't enough. And the matcher I used probably has a lot of false positives. It's a long way for me to distill a good, uh, a good set of um, you know, expressions that would be worth, um, the, you know, um, yeah, would be worth exploring. Um, so sorry, you were saying, Richard, I think you were saying that uh, there's um, in the spec uh, a particular expression that, Yes, um, it is. It is an expression that that would that would uh, tokenize differently based on um, awareness or lack thereof of semicolon insertion. Okay, try expanding chapter eleven lexical grammar. Yeah, so it will be right here. Okay, so uh, I oh, yep, there it is. So this one and that one. No, if you uh, it is is in the first text of section eleven. Uh, you could search. Yeah. So oh, section eleven at the top. Yeah, just at the very top, uh, right there. So good. Eight, good. Yeah. good. Thank you. Yes, that's that's exactly the kind of thing I had in mind. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so we're talking about this bit here. Yeah. Um, let's see if I can, um, if I if I remember what I used to do to put examples in here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just my brain is like trying to keep track of things. Um, uh, with regard to the use case that you, that that you're concerned with, let me also ask: if you simply rejected every program that would have triggered semicolon insertion. Uh, would that be within your use case, or does that violate your use case? Like, um, I I don't want to be too opinionated until I know if it's going to be problematic and not easy to handle. Okay, okay. So, so let's go ahead. Let's, let's proceed to try this out. Yeah, so I'm using the lazy approach, right? So if it's too much work, it, it has to be a really important thing. Um, why don't we just do this? Because I know that should work. Ah, my bad. I uh, eagerly, uh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. So this one is not a regular expression because it's preceded by B. Right. Whereas the first and the first one, it is uh, a regular expression. Yeah, and neither of those in this example are a regular expression. Oh, really? Yeah, it's not the it's not precisely the case I was looking for. But okay. Uh, well, what what is the correct interpretation of both of these? Uh, the the line on the bottom. So it's 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 b divided by the um, high divided by whatever value is produced by evaluating g dot exec dot map. I see. And because the one on the bottom passes, 
therefore no semicolon is inserted, and therefore the one on the top passes with the same interpretation. Correct. Um, but there's a small tweak to that that you could do that would force semicolon insertion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it might, yeah. I don't remember precisely what, it, what that would be, though. So, yeah, that gives me something to um, try to design, um, you know, con concepts for at this point. Um, so, so yeah, here definitely this is one of those cases where um, I have a thing about like regular expressions being followed by things, but I never thought about regular expressions being preceded by an identifier. Um, so yeah. Um, oh, wait a second. There's a space here. Where did that space well, come from? It doesn't from? matter. You remove all the spaces. It's the same as anything. Ah. Ah, so now, now you're interpreting both of them wrong. Well, it's really runtime error either way. I'm just safely saying. Uh, it, no, no, it's not. Ne neither of those, uh, uh, both of those can be evaluated and have the same interpretation. There is no runtime error in that code. So, so what is happening here is we're, we're running g execs uh, c dot map d and then we're dividing b over high over whatever that value here yes so but once you so it's okay so so this is a great example once you miss tokenize at this at the opening slash mm -hmm. then mistaking then, then all of the other uh, cases i was talking about easily follow, where you can construct a program where there are import statements inside comments, inside literal strings, inside regular expressions, and genuine import statements. And you can construct programs in which uh, your tokenizer will, mis will, will misunderstand any of them. So, um, so here we are not looking that this is a regular expression. We are looking that this is a two divisions over somehow a regular expression dot map. No, 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 no. There, 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 there is no regular expression. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, g dot, dot exec. Dot, okay, so this is a, a functional call. Right. And okay, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm eagerly, um, again, matching regular expressions. So this is where I expect all the failures at this point. Um, and, you know, again, it, it's not like I'm claiming that there are no weaknesses. I'm definitely the opposite. I, I actually know there are weaknesses. Um, and I, I, I appreciate this part. I'm going to have to think about that one. OK. But, uh, but, but my, you know, my concern is that, that in order to get to correctness with regard to these issues, mm -hmm. you can't just incrementally adjust your code when faced with each individual difficult case like this. You have to go back to the grammar definition and construct a principled mechanism of some sort, a state yeah. machine like Tim Disney did or something, but you have to, to really think through constructing a tokenizing mechanism yeah. that, is, that is derived from and adapted to the way in which the grammar is hard to tokenize. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm probably going to add a layer for automatic semicolon um, um, uh, inference um, before, before uh, tokenizing the next token. Um, at this point, I'm inferring by, uh, by uh, design. Like, like I designed things and it was inferred right so far. And then when I tested this case, no, like I need to be more um, intentional about my semicolon affecting the next token. Right, and if I recall correctly, um, uh, in order to tell whether a semicolon is inserted, you have to look ahead one token, yeah. uh, and then distinguish based on one token of look ahead, whether what you've seen before is potentially the beginning of a valid parse. Uh, and if it is only if it is not, and with the semicolon, um, the, the, the token so far, without further look ahead, 
is still the beginning, is now the beginning of a valid parse. Uh, in that circumstance, you do the token inference. So you can't do it without looking ahead one token. And then what Tim Disney did is he turned the issue of would it be a valid parse into um, uh, states that his state machine could distinguish. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm going to drive my design towards that. I see, uh, I'll see what it will look like. Um, but yeah, thanks for this. Like this case was right in the spec and I always tell people you should look in the spec. <laughs> but I did not expect the spec to actually point out, you know, the most, um, yeah, the other thing yeah, I, remember, I remember in the spec is I remember that there was one lexical level production that was parameterized, but I don't remember what it is. Oh my goodness, I don't, I don't remember either. Yeah, I remember that when I designed Jesse, one of the, the explicit goals in the Jesse grammar was to omit uh, enough of the JavaScript grammar that I did not need any parameterized productions. I think there were four parameterized productions altogether. Uh, one was at the token level and three were at the parser level, or it might have been the other way around. I think, I know, I remember it was, somehow I remember it was split three and one. Uh, it's documented in um, you know, my, the, um, the, the original um, uh, writing down of the Jesse grammar. Um, and it's, it's in the, uh the the proper grammar not annex b that's correct that's correct um so i'm just going to make this one a little bit more fun um i think that was the space in the source so i'm going to leave it there if it's a, a bad thing it's a bad thing i'm not gonna um the, the space should not make a difference if that space makes a difference you're doing something wrong no, I, I know. I, I just want to preserve the uh, the faithfulness of the original thing. I don't want. Okay. I don't want to mess mess things up. Um, you sure. know, from what they are in the in the source I copied them from. Okay. Um, so, Mark, I do see. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, like. Uh, I do are. see parameterization around um, identifier capture for yield and await. Ah. Oh. Uh, is that was was that a lexical issue or a person? Uh, it is under lexical, but it doesn't it doesn't have to be. It's because the lexical grammar distinguishes between uh, identifiers and other similar tokens. Um, but you could you could have a lexical analyzer that made no such distinction and be okay. I think. Yeah, so, so these cases, um, you know, they, they really don't have anything that would trip my, my logic um, as far as I see, because I'm not trying to say that else is a JavaScript keyword. I'm just saying that else, if it's not a JavaScript keyword, it's surely inferring that it should have been one. And it's a runtime error to execute this code. Um, and it's up to you to decide if you need to do something with the else, whether it's a valid thing or not as important to you. That, that, that's my, my thought at this point. Um, so when I say it's a keyword, as in it's a buzzword or a hot word or a word worth um, taking note of. Um, that's the only case that, you know, over here, again, this is syntax error for the runtime parser to throw at. Um, is that a good enough um, estimation of code? So I don't know enough about um, uh, the, co the, you know, all the various places where a keyword can occur to know if the state dependence of tokenization depends on accurately recognizing keywords. I don't know of a case where it does, um, but I don't know that it doesn't either. So that, that's, that's, you can consider that an open question. Yeah, so, so I'm saying that as far as my tokens are concerned, if you are looking for a for statement, you will come here 
it, if you're interested in the for statement syntax and whether or not it's valid, that's, that's uh, something you would start to do with the previous and next token. Um, and the additional um, imperative work that you will do here is um, a cost that you incur if you want to incur. Um, if you don't want to incur that cost, then the runtime will already throw most likely here. Uh, there is no second semicolon. Um, and that really shouldn't affect a transform of something that has nothing to do with the four statements. This part is interesting. I don't know what to say here. <laughs> or, or uh, here. Well, let me, we, spent, we spent a lot, lot, uh, lot, large amount of time. Uh, and we have 20 minutes left. Is there any other topics people would like to talk about? Uh, gladly. Um, so I took a, a different approach to the whole import export transforms. Um, basically, I we rejigged the the Jesse quasi the quasi Jesse grammar uh, to be extended into a grammar that does not create ASTs for most of the tr of the source code, but instead just returns source code strings. Um, so for Jesse specifically, bring the transformation from a valid Jesse program into uh, a AMD style define modules. Um, doesn't have to do all the negotiating of the whole AST, but just the top level things instead. Okay. Um, uh, can you show, uh, is there something relevant you could show? Um, yes. Okay. And um, I, uh, the, the thing I thought I was remembering about a parameterized uh, lexical level production, I'm not finding it. So I might, I might have been mistaken that there was a parameterized lexical level production. Um, so this is the drive grammar that I create from Jesse. Uh, and the, the main difference is that um, for different module items in the body of the module, I use this angle bracket notation, which in my peg parser means the semantic value of that production is exactly the source text between the angle brackets. Oh, cool. I didn't have anything like that. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, so I, I use that for tokens and, and other stuff, but it's also useful in this case where I can override the module item to uh, just take module declarations as sources and the semicolons as sources and only deal with the import and export declarations. Um, so then the, the rewriter, rewriter that I have is mostly complicated by the various ways you can bind expressions in the in export. Um, but so, in, so this is specifically for Jesse, correct? That's correct, yeah. So oh, that, it's, it's titled, I just noticed the file is titled Rewrite SES. Uh, rewrite to SES is more like it. Rewrite to SES, okay, okay, good. Uh, so the end goal is, um, I'll just pop open this thing here. The way the unit test goes is this is my trans this is a string that I'm trying to translate. I am supporting named exports for now, named exports and imports. Um, that may go away if it turns out to be too problematic, but uh, that is the only extension that I'm making so far. So you're, you're supporting what with imports and exports? Named imports and exports. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, um, simply because uh, it, it makes it difficult to export uh, multiple values without being able to mutate an object in place. Um, so ah. in this restriction, it, it makes it a lot easier to just use the named export for the, the sub, sub properties that you would only have on the main object. Well, uh, actually, no. I'm, can you show an example where it creates a notational difficulty? Um, 
this is uh, specifically with, let's see, I have parser utils. Oh yeah, quasi just, no, where is it? It's in the utilities, quasi utilities. So this is a, uh, oh no, is this it? No, I'd have to look more carefully for that. But what I was finding is that I would like to export a maker, but also have some properties on that maker. Ah, okay. That was difficult to do because I couldn't mutate the function, right? Once I define the function with the, the rules that we have around immunization so far, then I couldn't, couldn't go any further. I see. And you wanted to e export the function as the default export? That's correct, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's cor that's correct. If the function, if you're trying to export the function as a default, as opposed to just being one named member. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, yeah. So the the way that the the rewriter works is it basically uh, from this import export statements garbage that we have below. Um, this dollar h define is going to be the De declared in a library function as uh, the way to define modules. The dollar $h underscore means basically it's not, it's hidden to Jesse. It's an inaccessible symbol otherwise. Okay. Um, so then it's- is that, is that enforced somehow? Yes, it's enforced in the parser. Okay. Um, so it essentially means that Jesse code can't capture those, those functions and do something malicious. Okay. Um, Good. So uh, some, sometime we should talk about the Hilbert Hotel, uh, <laughs> uh, because with that parser rule, your parser does not, either your parser does not accept all valid Jesse, or you have to actually have as a specified part of the Jesse grammar that an identifier like $H underbar defined is not a valid identifier. Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so um, this $H define is basically the AMD define. Uh, okay. okay. Sorry, uh, sorry to chime in. Uh, I'm going to have to watch the remaining uh, bit in the recording. I do apologize. I have to run, but um, uh, yeah, so um, definitely um, looking forward to that part. Okay. Okay. Okay, see you. Um, so this imports from foo, imports some stuff from foo. So the, the second or the first argument to define is the foo module. And then it has a factory function that is called when foo is resolved with that, the foo modules exports as the first parameter to the function. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with AMD, but you mentioned your oh, project. Yeah. Yeah. So a AMD, um, the A stands for asynchronous. Is this, is this a synchronous analog of AMD? No, this is intended to be asynchronous as well. And basically because the only code inside the, the Jesse frame will be evaluated uh, within this context of defines, we don't get any problems between synchronizing the, the top level script tags and the actual imports and so on. So all this, all the script code is rewritten into H define. Is what I'm saying. Okay. It's all in a module context. So, so is this literally uh, within AMD? Uh, the idea is H define will will not be AMD spe specifically, but it will instead be an SES defended version of it. Uh, so that everything we're running is actually within an SES compartment. Okay. Uh, so, since you're supporting both defined exports and named exports, what do those turn into in these this way of per of, um, of of using names and the arguments of uh, dollar H defined? Uh, yeah. So, 
I need to, I've been trying to do research on this, but I haven't found many things that are conclusive. And I find the, the semantic, uh, semantics in the spec to be difficult to grasp exactly for this concept. But when the module is instantiated, what should be returned? Like what is the module record? And is default part of the namespace or is default outside the namespace is one question I would have. So it's part of, part of the reason why I thought to have Jesse only have a default export uh, was to avoid all those questions. Mm -hmm. um, and when you want to export a function and a bunch of other stuff, um, uh, within the Jesse that I had in mind, you would just name the function as well. And basically the, only, the, you know, the normal case is the only default export that you would use is still a uh, record of named members. Okay. And if you do that consistently, then the translation to this AMD form um, uh, would uh, just always be a single argument function where the argument itself was a record pattern. Uh, so in this case, the, the um, separate arguments to the factory function are correspond to the multiple modules that can be imported. Oh, 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 right, okay. Okay, sorry. I was, I was uh, at the wrong granularity, but that makes sense. Um, okay, so I guess I, I do actually want to know what the, <laughs> the real answer is because I'm still trying to find that. Do I need to somehow wrap the namespace in an object that can contain either a default or a namespace or both? Or is the default actually supposed to be part of the namespace object? That's what I've never figured out. Uh, Richard, I suspect you have a better, a more accurate sense of this than I do. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking through the spec now. Uh, I'm not sure what the answer is. Okay. I remember that the answer was thought through, but that is not any help. <laughs> Agreed. Okay. So uh, this format, um, uh, you're thinking of it as AMD-like, including the asynchronous. For the code inside here, for, the, for, for this generated code, uh, is there any way in which the generated code embodies a assumption of asynchrony? Or, by, or is it the case that with a different definition of H define, I could actually run this in a synchronous manner. You could run it as a, as a synchronous code. Um, the, only difference, the only difference then would be uh, when you're resolving circular imports and stuff like that, like you, you just have to do it up front. Okay. Okay. And, uh, uh, and with the asynchronous, there's no ability to deal with um, circular imports anyway. Uh, there is in the sense that you can see which the imports are before you actually evaluate a module. So the uh, Polymer has uh, an AMD loader that is significantly simpler than RequireJS. And mm -hmm. essentially they have phases to the loading in which they've uh, defined the module, initialized it, loaded it, and so on. And in any of those phases, you can uh, that's basically how, how they handle the circularity is to make sure that it happens in a different phase. Okay, I, I didn't form a image that I understood from that, but, but I, I think we can postpone that. Sure. Okay, uh, uh, okay so uh, an answer to the previous, it looks like export default is mapped to an export identifier containing asterisks, which obviously there would be no other way to produce. Okay. So it's just, it's just a, uh, an otherwise inaccessible name for the export. Okay. 
So when you import uh, import something or star as my star from a module that exports defaults, can you get to it via my star? Is my question. I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, that's easy to do. Uh, sorry, uh, what was the question? Could you repeat it? I'm actually back. Um, if you if you imp if a module exports default, yes, and you import star as foo from my foo. Yeah, it's um, it's actually on that star. Mm -hmm. So foo dot default is the default. Are you sure? Yeah, if, if you're only exporting a default, then you only have a, a named um, entity in the namespace that is imported, and that named entity is called default. Yeah, that's what I gathered from some other code I read, but I'm not sure what actually is right. Yeah, that, that, that is actually true. Like, I use it um, in, in certain patterns. Uh, when I want to export a ready promise sometimes, I do it that way. Okay. Um, with this translation, uh, can I just concatenate this translation uh, as a uh, packaging? Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. So, um, oh, go ahead. Uh, um, if so I've been, so um, uh, for Agoric's purposes, for the purpose of Agoric, um, uh, having a, a simple translation from uh, uh, import into evaluable scripts, and then having a packaging logic, which we were really super confident preserved semantics, because, um, uh, for example, roll-up, we've continually gotten into problems where it's renamed something uh, uh, without checking, without in some hands, you know, uh, renaming something where uh, the code itself was actually dependent on the name. Right, yeah. So uh, over and over again, we've been screwed up by uh, roll-up not being semantics preserving, and we've gotten into different problems with different packagers. Um, and obviously for security work, uh, we have to be confident that the program that's executed means what the programmer wrote according to the programming language semantics uh, as interpreted against the original source. So it seems like what I'm seeing here would work equally well as a transform from uh, SES modules to a big evaluable script? Uh, yes, if you can write the grammar that describes all of SES. That's the only downside here. Okay, okay. Okay, so that's great. I'm, I'm working from first principles and anything that is not a valid Jesse program doesn't get this far. Yeah, so for the immediate work uh, purposes, uh, doing the rewrite and packaging at build time uh, satisfies our immediate needs. So for that, we could just do a Babel full AST based translator. Right. Um, but eventually, it'd be very nice to have the kind of thing that Sala was talking about. Because um, okay. uh, it is the case that if you can accurately lex, then you can just trigger the parsings that you need and ignore all the rest of it. And that would be really cool to have at runtime. Yeah, for the SES case, that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, that's all I wanted to show. So uh, we can go on to other things if people want. So, so a translated text two, doesn't that also need to be a dollar something underbar translated text two? Because otherwise you're bringing that name into scope and it might be captured. This is my test case. So uh, this is actually a just test. OK, so I'm just comparing the output of the translator. Yeah, I'm comparing my translate functions output to this translated text. 
so that the translator returns an object, a promise for an object that evaluates into the parameters it was called with, as well as the translated text. So I'm just comparing the translated text here. I see, I see, I see. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, Mark, you said a statement um, uh, a few minutes ago about the eventuality. Um, yeah. So, so I basically uh, would like to phrase this as, I, I thought this eventuality as something people are staying away from, and I wanted to start driving towards that eventuality. I am a long way from getting there, um, and I'm, I'm, I don't think, like I never thought that alone I would be the person doing it. Uh, I, I really hope that, you know, that direction would have more interest and other people start, you know, being involved in that because, you know, as far as my, my own um, end, end goals for this, um, like I've, I've already used it to develop a lot of things that I've, I've been trying to develop for a long time. Um, but I know that the idea that at runtime, doing as little parsing as you need in, with a parsing approach that is, um, that doesn't use the overhead intended for development tooling um, is, is obviously something that is, is, you know, an eventuality that people are not trying to gear towards. And so I, I don't know if I uh, made it uh, any clearer. I tried. <laughs> so uh, Jesse modules, all of which are pure, uh, should be insensitive to uh, whether you're um, uh, evaluating them uh, asynchronously with regard to each other or synchronously and also probably pretty insensitive to the order as long as uh, the dependencies are respected. Um, uh, SES, uh, in order to be compatible with more code, also admits resource modules and resource modules importing resource modules can be state coupled to each other. So um, uh, the link, if the, if the, the linking of ECMAScript modules to each other doesn't run any user code in, in the semantics of it, uh, and therefore the linking is, should not be order dependent, but then the initialization phase is. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, li linking that's asynchronous uh, should be fine as long as all of the initialization logic uh, is actually run synchronously and in the order that a uh, ECMAScript module program would expect. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that's a really good um, uh, concrete um, um, thing to work with because I, I saw to some extent um, that as far as Jesse was concerned, um, I, I think we're having module factories, which are really the, um, you know, the synchronous um, aspect being wrapped inside a function uh, that only executes when it's actually available. That's right. That's, yeah, for, for Jesse, that's exactly right. Yes, so, so that, that gave me the, um, the confidence, let's say, um, to say that, okay, a module loader for this purposes is not going to be difficult. I, I think for Jesse, that's correct. Um, but, but the way you made the contrast with, with SES code having resource modules, the complexity of uh, preserving the graph sequence uh, that is inferred by the semantics of import and export statements being used by the original author, um, is, is uh, basically um, an additional complexity that I'm, I'm trying to design towards. Um, so so I, I also took this in mind, but I, I think there is an assumption that I'm making that probably uh, I should disclose is that so far I'm working from the um, assumption that source code, um, adversarial source code 
um, is definitely um, going to require um, a second phase of, of you know, um, so, so the initial design of SES frame and Jesse frame will assume that uh, you're loading code from a trusted origin that is only giving you trusted code. Um, and then we start securing that mechanism to, in order for us to actually allow it to get code from untrusted sources. Um, and, and I think it's a very, very big um, uh, journey in, in my, you know, from my perspective to go from, from the initial um, concept to um, runtime run parsing that, that can definitely guard against that kind of malicious code. So for Jesse, if the if if the you know if both the benevolent and the malicious code are supposed to be in Jesse, and if they're not in Jesse, you're it's okay to statically reject it. Uh, then I think you should pretty much already be there because Jesse already has an accurate parser, and it will, you know, written by Michael, uh, which will already I believe uh, Michael correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, already with confidence reject anything that is not syntactically uh, valid, Jesse, at least syntactically with regard to the grammar. Definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to, sorry, Michael, you, you should pitch in as well, but I'm, I'm working with that assumption. The only assumption that was missing was how to handle import and export statements. And we're taking alternative uh, um, design uh, uh, paths towards this, me and Michael. So I think I think that what Michael showed does does translate import and export statements into something that you should be able to work with directly. And for Jesse, as opposed to Sess, doing this even based on a full parse uh, should still not be that onerous. Um, doing a full parse of SES is is onerous, and I'd like to avoid it. But I wouldn't be too scared of doing a full parse of Jesse. Um, yeah, so, so uh, I might have missed the detail, but Michael, are you doing the transform from import and export in, in the uh, runtime, or are you doing it to package things to give it to the runtime? Uh, this is for the service worker or for the, the site service that wraps Jesse programs into something. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, so uh, are, are we, uh, sorry, one second. Uh, so are, are we saying that um, the, the code that comes from the server will have import and export statements um, and, and you will uh, basically in the service worker be able to translate that into AMD? Yeah, that's basically the idea. Um, I was thinking that even if the code on the server has import and export in it, there could also be a service that falls back if the service worker is not available. Mm -hmm. That we do the same kind of rewrite, but yeah. But would the service worker have enough um, um, a person ca capacity that it would be able to do it independent from a secondary service or a fallback service? Yes, that's my addition. Okay, so your um, Jesse translate function that you're having in the API is basically doing this AMD rewrite. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So good. Good. It sounds good to me too. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, I think this was a, um, we got, you know, uh, several topics uh, covered in this meeting. It's a good meeting. So I am now going to adjourn. Good night. All right, good night. Take care, everyone. Yep.